The search for missing IU student Lauren Spear is in its second day at a landfill in Vigo County. Many critics are asking why... New evidence looking for answers to the disappearance of IU student Lauren Spear. Lauren Spear has become a household name. One of the highest profile missing person cases in America. Lauren Spire disappeared on June 3, 2011, following an evening at Kilroy Sports Bar, a bar in Bloomington, Indiana. At the time, she was a 20-year-old student at Indiana University. Lauren was born in January 17, 1991 to Charlene and Robert Spire. She grew up in Scarsdale, New York, a town in Lower Westchester County. She graduated from Edgemont High School in 2009 and enrolled at Indiana University, where she was studying textiles merchandising. Lauren was active in the Jewish community at IU and had spent the previous spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund. Lauren met her boyfriend Jesse Wolf and her friend Jay Rosenbaum years earlier at Camp Tawanda, a summer camp in the mountain town of Honesdale, Pennsylvania. It was there that she also met various other future IU students who later became her circle of friends when she enrolled there in 2009. On the night Lauren disappeared, she was drinking with several friends. Her boyfriend Jesse stated that he did not go out with Lauren or her friends that evening. Although he had texted back and forth with Lauren before he went to bed. According to witnesses, Lauren was very intoxicated. Bloomington police used video surveillance footage and witness statements to create a timeline of Lauren's whereabouts before her disappearance. Friday, June 3, 2011 at 12.30 a.m. Lauren left her apartment with a friend named David Ron. They then went to Jay Rosenbaum's apartment, and she met up with Corey Rossman, Jay Rosenbaum's neighbor. At 1.46 a.m. Lauren is seen entering Kilroy Sports Bar. At 2.27 a.m. Lauren is seen exiting the bar with Corey Rossman. Lauren left her cell phone and shoes at the bar. She had taken off her shoes when she walked out onto the sand-covered patio. Corey Rossman walked with Lauren to her apartment complex. Lauren, who had a heart condition was drunk and snorted clonazepam and cocaine at some point in the night. At 2.30 a.m. Lauren is seen entering Smallwood Plaza Apartments, where she lived. A passerby named Zach Oakes noticed her level of intoxication and asked if she was okay. Corey and Lauren never made it inside Lauren's apartment because they were stopped by Zach and his friends. Corey was punched in the face during this altercation. Corey and Lauren then left Lauren's building and headed to Corey's apartment. At 2.48 a.m. after they left the apartments, they entered an alley between College Avenue and Morton Street. Security cameras on nearby apartments spot her exit the alley at 2.51 a.m. and walk toward an empty lot. Her keys and purse were found through the alley. Corey eventually picked her up and carried her over his shoulder. Lauren and Corey Rossman arrived at Corey's apartment shortly afterward. Corey's roommate Michael Beth was at the apartment. He claimed that Corey was very intoxicated and stumbling. He vomited on the carpet on the way upstairs. Michael Beth stated that he escorted Corey to bed. He then tried to persuade Lauren to sleep over for her own safety. He claimed that she said she wanted to return to her own apartment. At 3.30 a.m. Michael Beth said he then phoned his neighbor, Jay Rosenbaum, wanting him to take care of Lauren. Michael Beth said that she was attempting to get him to drink with her at her own apartment but he declined. She eventually went to Jay Rosenbaum's apartment, where he observed a bruise under her eye, sustained in a fall earlier that evening. She told him she did not know how she got the bruise. Two calls were placed from Jay's phone shortly before she is reported to have left. Jay said that Lauren placed both calls, one to David Ron and one to another friend. Neither picked up, and no messages were left. At 4.30 a.m. Jay Rosenbaum reports that Lauren left the apartment. This is the last reported sighting of her. He reported last seeing Lauren at the intersection of 11th Street and College Avenue, headed south on College. She was last seen barefoot, wearing black leggings and a white shirt. Several hours later that morning, Lauren's boyfriend Jesse Wolf sent Lauren a text. He received a reply from an employee at the bar. He then contacted authorities and reported Lauren missing. Hadar Tamir, Lauren's roommate, claimed that Jesse Wolf met her on campus to retrieve a key to go to the apartment to look for her, however they found nothing, and there was no sign of Lauren. 
It soon became clear that Lauren never returned home. An internet sleuth later claimed to have seen a tweet that showed Jay Rosenbaum had been throwing a party with unidentified visitors from Michigan that morning. The tweet, if it did in fact exist, is no longer posted publicly, but reports of it raised questions about what the visitors might know. There were other people around. An attorney for Jay Rosenbaum stated that the police have all their names and information. June 3, 2011, at 4:35 a.m., a homeless man reportedly hears a woman scream just west of where Lauren Spire was last seen. Rumors of the scream began shortly after news of Lauren's disappearance got out. A reporter from the Bloomington Herald Times later investigated the claim, but it's not clear whether police ever ran down the tip. Speculation on the man's identity centered around a well-known Bloomington itinerant named Franklin Road Dog Crawford, who died just a few days after Lauren disappeared. My first thing is to say to the person that has Lauren or that has harmed Lauren, shame on you. Shame on you. You're on the search and fire. Search. Search. Right. Hundreds of volunteers you walk up and down the streets, check dumpsters, yeah. check alleyways. Join Lauren's parents. Make sure you pay attention to the creek area while you're down there. Okay. Full of hope she would be found safe and soon. I came out today just to help look for Lauren, and it's just a lot of massive territory. They searched abandoned quarries. And we're continuing the search that we started. Dense forests. Here, still committed to finding her. It's our worst nightmare. Kardashian and Seacrest now tweeting for volunteers to join the search. A massive search and a $100,000 reward have turned up little. And then, as a last-ditch effort, police searched the landfill used by the city of Bloomington. Probably the hardest thing that, that we had to do in the searches was to go to that landfill. Yeah. Stand there, watch them. The search turned up empty. I start my every day hoping that today is a day. I go to sleep every night knowing that I have failed. And then I haven't. I'm sorry. I haven't done enough. But, um... Security cameras caught a suspicious white truck in the area late at night the night Lauren disappeared. The truck belonged to a man named James McLeish. James McLeish was a felon just released from prison for assaulting his ex-wife. He had been living in a halfway house near where Lauren was last seen. An acquaintance of James reached out to investigators claiming that James was involved in Lauren's disappearance. Private investigators requested that he undergo a polygraph test in which he agreed.
I'm pleading with you to be that person that defines yourself as the person that helped us. Lauren Spears' mother Charlene delivered an emotional plea to the press Monday after Bloomington Police Captain Joe Qualters dismissed what seemed to be their only credible lead thus far, a white truck appearing to circle the area around Lauren's supposed last known location, was found to be in no way connected to the 20-year-old IU student's disappearance. We are satisfied with not only the information provided to our investigators, but also the video information uh, that supports that vehicle uh, being excluded. Police had incorrectly believed the truck passed by twice, prompting the initial suspicion, but learned of a video surveillance timing discrepancy over the weekend that proved it had in fact only passed by once. The driver was picking up a co-worker and reportedly did not see anything suspicious. I think you know by now that the search has extended to large spaces of land outside the city of Bloomington. So it takes a significant effort of people and power to get out there and cover all that ground. Sunday marked the first time the search expanded to an area outside Monroe County when police received a tip about a foul odor near Martinsville in Morgan County. The tip did not yield any leads. For WTIU News, I'm Alex Roy. On January 28, 2016, the FBI conducted a raid of the home of 35-year-old Justin Wagers in Martinsville, 20 miles north of Bloomington. Justin Wagers was suspected of exposing himself to many women. The FBI and other police agencies searched the home where he lived with his mother and stepfather until he was arrested. In 2011, Justin Wagers called a woman 44 times and threatened to kill her. He violated a protective order by calling the woman and saying, let me tell you something. I could slip into your house and do you in and nobody would even know I was there. His relationship to the woman is unclear, but he reportedly told her she is going to be sorry for hurting him. Justin Wagers pleaded guilty to felony intimidation. He received a three-year prison sentence, with two years suspended. However, investigators do not believe that Justin Wagers is involved in Lauren's disappearance. Several theories have appeared around what happened to Lauren that evening. Her parents have said that they believe their daughter is dead. Based on her level of intoxication, they also felt that she may have been drugged while at the bar. The family has voiced many suspicions about the men she was with that evening as well as her boyfriend Jesse Wolf, since they refused to take police-issued polygraphs and lawyered up soon after Lauren's disappearance. While the parents have not made any specific accusations, they do believe the two know more than they have told police so far. The men responded that they have taken privately administered polygraphs, as well as one from the FBI. And they claim they do not trust the Bloomington police, and that is the reason that they retained lawyers. On April 24, 2015, Indiana University senior Hannah Wilson's body was found in an isolated area. The night before she had been out with friends celebrating her good grades at the same bar Lauren attended the night she went missing. Hannah's friends had called her a taxi to drop her off at home because she was very intoxicated. She was dropped off at home by a taxi, but her friends reported her missing when they found her cell phone and purse on her bed and the front door wide open the next morning. Officers found Hannah's body the next day on a rural road in Brown County, around 30 minutes from campus. A cell phone was found next to Hannah's body belonged to 49-year-old Daniel Messel. Before he investigates, has discovered disturbing new details about the man convicted in the murder of IU student Hannah Wilson. Daniel Messel is now facing attempted rape charges for an assault that happened over two years before he killed Hannah. And now our Sandra Chapman uncovers a trail of troubling behavior that one woman says should have raised flags. For the first time, that woman is speaking out about what she calls the scary encounters and missed clues. <laughs> A familiar scene in the heart of a college town. Young co-eds out for the night, but in the fall of 2012, six young women called police, a suspicious man trying to get girls in his SUV, an attempt at rape and sexual battery, all within weeks of each other. A man targeting women, out alone, who had been drinking. This was clear to me that this was a pattern for Mr. Messel. Bloomington police issued no warning. The number of people that live in that area that tried to report it, it's very scary. This 22-year-old is still upset. She wants her identity concealed, but believes the public should know Daniel Messel harassed young women and got away with it until he committed murder. 
I think it's very telling that there were five witnesses that could testify about how they witnessed this person basically trying to find women to get into his car. She says she reported harassing behavior three times in the fall of 2012. One night while sitting on her porch on Grant Street, a friend emerged from the dark running. A man had approached her twice trying to get her into his car. She was just so freaked out. That was aggressive enough to me that I felt like we should call the police. That was August 29, 2012. Three days later, Indiana University police responded to the attempted rape of a 22-year-old law student. The woman had been out drinking and ended up in a car with a strange man who tried to sexually assault her. She fought back, scratching him before he punched her in the face and took off. She couldn't identify him, but had snagged his DNA under her fingernails. University police say state police did not run the DNA sample through the Indiana or FBI database, claiming there wasn't sufficient quantity for comparison. But if it had been, could it have provided a match to Daniel Messel sooner? Messel's DNA had been in the system since July 1997 from prior felony convictions for violence against women. According to the Indiana Department of Correction, the decision not to run the sample could be a haunting one. He was seeking out a way to carry out his fantasies. By November 2012, the women living near Grant Street had seen the guy in the silver Kia so much they gave him a nickname, the Creeper. But this victim says Bloomington police didn't really seem to care. I think my mindset was that they would want to know that there was an aggressive person and a creepy person <laughs> driving around. Clearly, this is these are red flags that we have a potential stalker or even a violent person. Ted Adams is the Brown County prosecutor who convicted Messel in the Hannah Wilson case. He believes Messel followed Hannah home from a bar and somehow got her into his SUV. These crime scene photos show she put up a fight. Her hair and blood were found inside his car. During the struggle, his phone got knocked out of his pocket and landed beneath Hannah's feet. That's what led investigators to Messel. Adams also discovered disturbing pornography on Messel's computer. I think one of them being drunk, uh, sex with drunk, passed out girls, which clearly we wanted to get into a trial and, and we were not able to do so. Based on what happened to six different women, Adams believes Messel had an attack zone within a four by five block area stretching from 10th Street to Kirkwood and between Dunn and Walnut. Just a week after Bloomington police stopped and identified Messel in November 2012, another woman reported a sexual battery. The 18-year-old admitted to accepting a ride from a man she now believes was Messel. He had grabbed her head and thrust it onto his lap. Um, she struggled with him and then ended up jumping out of the vehicle. Days later, the so-called creeper was trying to corner another victim and her friend. It was extremely scary the way that he pulled up on the sidewalk and tried to basically accost us. The young women got away and helped Bloomington police track Messel down. I had his license plate number and that's how they were able to pull him over that night and catch him with his pants down. 428 LKH, I'm pretty sure. Take a look. It's the very same license plate number found on Messel's SUV after his arrest in the Hannah Wilson case three years later. Messel was questioned and released after the sexual battery victim could not pick him out of a lineup. 13 Investigates has learned Messel had a camera with video of himself asking girls for directions. I'm dying to know what was on that camera. I don't think that evidence was collected. Over two years later, investigators working with the prosecutor's office called one of the victims to say the man she reported to Bloomington police was now a murder suspect. I just remember my dad saying, oh, my God. When you see this picture, does this remind you of anything that you saw? It just gives me the worst feeling. It makes my stomach drop. The day after Daniel Messel was convicted of Hannah Wilson's murder, IU police got a chilling phone call. The attempted rape victim from September 2012 believed Messel was her attacker, too. University police requested ISP run the DNA sample collected from under her fingernails and compare to Messel's profile.
and the sample came back, I think, one in one million um, as a match to Daniel Messel's DNA profile. This victim wonders what could have happened if police had put the pieces together earlier. I don't know for sure that they could have prevented Hannah's death, but I think there are a lot of other things that they could have done differently to try to make campus safer. Messel has not been charged in any other 2012 case except the attempted rape. Now, both Indiana State Police and Bloomington Police declined to speak with us about Messel's DNA and timeline reports because of Messel's pending charges. Meanwhile, the victim in the sexual battery case has since submitted evidence for her case, John. You're talking about things that happened in 2012, which is not long after the disappearance of Lauren Spear. That's right. And you got to wonder if, if there's any connection being drawn there. John, it is a big question for a lot of people. The Brown County prosecutor has confirmed that Bloomington police reviewed the Hannah Wilson murder files in connection with Lauren Spear's disappearance. He says Messel has and remains a person of interest, and right now, that's all that he can say. So remains to be seen. That's right. That goes. All right. Thank you, Sandra. Lauren's friends and boyfriend Jesse Wolf told police that she used drugs in addition to alcohol on the night leading up to her disappearance. Jesse Wolf's mother claimed that Lauren had been kicked out of the summer camp she attended with Jesse due to drug use. Jay Rosenbaum told investigators that Lauren consumed alcohol, snorted cocaine, and crushed up clonazepam tablets that evening. This could have affected her rare heart condition, Long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome is a condition in which repolarization of the heart after a heartbeat is affected. It results in an increased risk of an irregular heartbeat which can result in fainting, drowning, seizures, or sudden death. These episodes can be triggered by exercise or stress. Police addressed rumors that implied Lauren may have overdosed and those with her may have hidden her body to avoid criminal charges. The police also acknowledge that they have not ruled out other possibilities, such as abduction by a stranger. A private investigator hired by the Spire family doubts that a fatal drug overdose could be enough motive to hide her death. If Lauren had attempted to go back to her apartment, she would likely not be able to get in because she had dropped her keys and purse. Did she get to her apartment and realize she didn't have her keys? Could she have gone wandering alone trying to find her belongings? On September 2, 2010, nine months before her disappearance, Lauren was arrested on charges of public intoxication and illegal consumption. After her disappearance, police found a small amount of cocaine in her room. Lauren's condition with her heart usually requires the use of beta blockers. Beta blockers are a medication used to block adrenaline and slow the heart as well as lower blood pressure for people with heart conditions, which is the opposite of cocaine. Cocaine is a stimulant, acting to speed up the cardiovascular system. Sometimes, cocaine can cause the heart to beat irregularly, resulting in cardiovascular distress, heart attack or even heart failure. Cocaine causes blood vessels to narrow. This lowers oxygen level availability and can result in tissue damage. The heart, like other organs, needs oxygen to function, and lowering oxygen levels can result in a heart attack or even death. Beta blockers open blood vessels, when taken as prescribed and without other drugs. Beta blockers taken with cocaine can have an opposite effect. When taken with cocaine, beta blockers can further narrow blood vessels. Combining beta blockers and cocaine can lead to even less oxygen being available in the body and extremely high blood pressure. Cocaine use can reduce the effectiveness of beta blockers. In some cases, beta blockers can make the cardiovascular effects of cocaine worse. The side effects of combining beta blockers and cocaine are often silent, such as blood vessel tightening and chest pain, but it is common to have no noticeable symptoms. This may result in tissue damage, heart problems, stroke, or death. Lauren's parents filed a civil lawsuit against Corey Rossman, Jason Rosenbaum, and Michael Beth. The suit accused the men of negligence, alleging that Corey Rossman and Jason Rosenbaum supplied Lauren with alcohol after she was already visibly intoxicated, and then neglected to assure she returned safely to her apartment, which led to her death. The family has said that they hope the lawsuit will lead to one of the men coming forward with more information about what occurred that night. As part of the suit, they subpoenaed private cell phone and academic records spanning about four and a half months before and after the night Lauren's disappearance. In 2013, 
Federal Judge Tanya Walton Pratt dismissed the suit against Michael Beth, ruling that he had no duty to care for Lauren Spirer. In 2014, Judge Pratt dismissed the suit against the other two men, saying, Unfortunately, there could be any number of theories as to what happened to Lauren and what, if any, injuries she may have sustained. Without evidence to prove these theories, it would be impossible for a jury to determine if whatever happened to Lauren was a natural and probable consequence of her intoxication, without any other intervening acts that would break the causal chain. Lauren Spire's parents have appealed the ruling. Lawyers for the men have stated that their clients have cooperated fully with police and that all of them have passed private polygraphs. Corey Hammersley was a student at Indiana University with Lauren. He was jailed for 24 years in 2013 after shooting at police while high on drugs. He was found guilty of attempted murder after unloading 32 bullets into a random house and car, and then shooting at police when they arrived. He was in the drug scene at Indiana University. Police also believe Lauren was involved with the same crowd after finding cocaine in her apartment after she vanished. An inmate serving time with Corey Hammersley at Indiana State Prison claims they were playing cards in his cell when an image of Lauren flashed up on the television behind them. Another inmate that was locked up with Corey. They were playing cards. Lauren's picture comes up on the television. Missing IU student Lauren Spear. And immediately, Corey looks up at the TV and says, man... I knew the guys that did that. The inmate who served time with Hammersley agreed to recount what he says Hammersley told him if we blacked out his face. And they were drinking and got to do an ecstasy, and she OD'd. It scared them. They didn't know what to do with her, and they took her down to the Ohio River and got rid of her, and then he said disposed of her body. This is a theory you are taking a hard look at. Absolutely, because one of the mistakes in most criminal cases is we investigators try to make them too complicated. The simplest is, she died at a party in Bloomington and somebody got rid of her. And it could be right here in this And river. it could be right here exactly at the Ohio River. A prison interview by Garrett, his partner Bill Benjamin, and the former student, the naked gunman, Corey Hammersley. You and others, you know, maybe had moved her body. Absolutely. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely not. Okay. I've never met this person before in my life. He believed he was lying to you. He clearly was lying to me. But, you know, the, the, the most interesting thing was the end of the interview. If something came up, would you contact us? If something was jogging your memory, or somebody brings something up in here, would you like to you know? Honestly, probably not. I do not want to be associated with this at all. No. I, no. I will not help you. I will not tell you anything I learned. And that's just the way it's going to be. We just would like to... Be able to bring Lauren home. I'm looking at him. Lauren Spear grew up in the New York City suburb of Scarsdale. What are you going to be? I'm going to be a princess. You're going to be. A She's a great kid. Uh, high energy. Very caring. Very caring. Loving. I love you. You love me. We are happy She really had a zest for life. I love that. I know. That's so Lauren. Her heartbroken mother and father, Charlene and Rob Spear, that made me cry, honey. Try now to smile through their tears as they remember the good times. The child ballerina. Mom and Dad, I just want to say thank you. I'm having an amazing night and I love you too so much. The coming of age at her bat mitzvah. We're proudest of how she handles herself, her boundless potential and her joy in living life. You are proud parents. Yeah, we're very proud. So proud. Very proud. The call that ended her parents' dreams for Lauren came on June 3rd, 2011. We were eating dinner and Robbie, the phone rang, I went to answer the phone and Robbie said, Char, Lauren's missing. So, it's really heart-stopping, you know? At the end of the day, it's just the two of us dealing with um, the sadness and the emptiness of Lauren's disappearance. And every day, you wake up thinking about Lauren? Every day. Oh, every day. How, how could you not? She's just as much a part of our lives now as she ever was, so. Now it's all about just, you know, finding her, 
getting answers to what happened to her. We know that she just didn't fall off the face of the earth and vaporize. I mean, something happened to our daughter. And we believe that there are people out there that know exactly what happened to our daughter. That's the most frustrating thing, is knowing that somebody knows right now. And they could change our lives in the blink of an eye. Just tell us where Lauren is. Person with her, this is all I can say, I'm sorry, but I just hope that they find her as soon as possible and I'm praying for her and her family. Adding to the parents' anger, they say Rossman was the one friend who refused to talk to them or their investigators. And he claims he lost all memory of what happened after being logged at Lauren's apartment building. That punch or punches uh, caused him uh, a temporary memory loss. Do you buy that? No, I don't. I think it's a case of self-preservation. He knows more than he's saying? I'm not sure of anything, but what I do know is that uh, there's been a complete lack of cooperation. Uh, and he was the person that spent the most time with Lauren in the last hours of her being seen. And he hasn't come forward to try to help? No. He's resisted. Corey, Brian Ross from ABC News 2020. Can we talk to you for just a second about Lauren Spear? Rossman has denied any involvement in Lauren's disappearance, but declined repeated requests to talk with 2020. Corey, why won't you talk with uh, Lauren's parents? They just want to ask you some questions about what happened that night. Anything you can say at all? property, you'll be safe. What else is under the surface here that we don't? Where are you, my sweet girl? I'm, I'm just missing you so desperately. Uh, you wouldn't believe all the people that have been helping us search for you. There are literally thousands of people that have come out and helped and so desperately want to help us find you, you know, everybody except for the right person. Um, if I could have the answer to one question, Lauren, that question would be, where are you? Um, so we're really missing you. We're really loving you. and doing everything possible we can to find you. Lauren, you would be absolutely amazed at the outpouring of support and compassion that people in this community and back home have shown for you and for us. Uh, we're so truly grateful for everything that everyone has done. And if you looked around town, you would see your poster everywhere. Uh, right now, school has already started, and I see your face in so many of the young people walking around here. Your mom and I go around town in the Bloomington vicinity, and we see you in so many places that we share together as a family. Uh, you are here. We're still fighting for you. We'll st we're still searching for you. We will not give up. We are determined. We love you so much and hope that we can do whatever needs to be done to bring you home. If I could stop time, I would stop time. I feel like everybody is sort of racing to that mark and not thinking about what maybe we can accomplish before June 3rd. So for me, I don't even want to think about June 3rd. I want to think about what we can do today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and, and hopefully that It'll be the day that we get answers to help us find Lauren. I don't want to jump ahead to, it's not something I want to celebrate, it's not something I look forward to, it's not something I want to talk about. So. It's not a, a marker that's important to us, really. It just, um, it illustrates how long it's been since we've seen our daughter. But, uh, you know, every day is a tough day. I think June 3rd will be a tough day, but um, we just hope it doesn't roll into June 4th. I mean, we always hope that there's a possibility that... I just don't, I don't know. We try to be realistic. Yeah. We do. We know that if she had the chance to come home or reach out to us, she would have done it. And you just don't ever know when it's going to overtake you. The missing Lauren and...
the longing, you know, it's... It's you really learn what that word heartache means because you literally ache. So, I think we're just kind of stuck in this place and until we know something, I think it's going to be very difficult to go to any other place. Right. We don't think about moving forward. We're just caught at a moment in time and that moment just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. That's really what, that's the way I feel. I don't think about moving on. There are so many emotions that are, you know, it, it, it angers me that, as I've said, somebody knows right now where Lauren is. It's, it's just incredibly frustrating. I don't know what's going to make a difference. I don't know what it's going to take. If you or someone you know knows anything about the disappearance of Lauren Spirer, please contact the Lauren Spirer tip line or mail anonymously to find Lauren at P.O. Box 1226 Bloomington, Indiana 47402. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more videos.